Hello. Hi. You don't all have to wave, but a couple waves. <laughs> uh, thank you for being here. My name is Evan Zipporin, and I'm very happy to be the director of MIT's new Center for Art, Science, and Technology, and even happier to be able to welcome our guest for the week, actually the first and inaugural artist brought here as part of the center, Thomas Saraceno. And um, we are just, as a center, getting up and running. Uh, my co-director is Lee Kinney, and I also want to thank um, Liz Murphy, who produced this event, and Anya Ventura, who did a lot of the writing to generate interest to get you here. Um, it's been an incredibly interesting and busy week for Tomas. I can't imagine he has anything left to say, <laughs> but we're going to make him talk for a couple of hours anyway. Um, I just briefly, you've been seeing slides of some of the events we have coming up in the spring. I hope that uh, you will take note of these and that uh, we'll, we'll see you for some or many of them. I would just now like to introduce the host of this panel, Moving Beyond Materiality, something we all need to try to do. Um, the head of the Ar Department of Architecture here at MIT, Nadir Tehrani, and he will bring out the panel. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to tonight's event. It's a great pleasure to be able to make an introduction for such an occasion, as it represents the best of MIT, a place that not only promises to mediate between the arts, sciences, and technology, but in fact, to draw out its greatest potentials. I do want to also thank Leela Kinney for making this possible and CAST in general for making this entire week possible. Uh, CAST has been at the forefront of many such opportunities and we in architecture have benefited a great deal from their broad vision in helping us to expand our culture. This is great. Before I introduce tonight's speaker, I would like to first welcome Anton Garcia Abril, who will alongside me help to moderate and act as interlocutor for the evening. It is no accident that he is here with us tonight. Anton just joined the Faculty of Architecture and promises to bring great maturity and sophistication to the arena of design and building technology specifically within our uh, curriculum. With his team at Ensemble and their Pop Lab, Anton's presence has already been felt in the halls of third semester, CORE, and we've all had the honor of hearing him speak about his own work and research for the open house just two weeks ago. Anton's presence is known on the global stage, and his work is widely recognized for its invention, its rigor, and play. His focus on material agency and its corollary methods of fabrication have brought new life to ancient ways of conceiving building protocols, while, also, while, they, all, while they have also brought new depth to modern construction systems. Of the many protein ways he has operated on material systems, maybe his reassessment of masonry and concrete structures remain the most alarming and seductive. In an era where we can only conceive of stone as veneers, as finishes, or as ornament, Anton has brought new weight to the medium. His music studies center, the truffle, and the SGAE headquarters are but three examples that bear witness to the astonishing ways in which his studio has reinvigorated a discourse on stereotomy, on the monolithic, and on the colossal, not to mention the monumental. While these were categories previously reserved for the arena of history and theory, looking back at the Neolithic period, or more recently, if you like, towards the Romanesque, I'm reminded of the way in which all of this was re-theorized by Rodolphe el Khoury in his book on the monolith in the 1990s, examining the way in which contemporary buildings are revisiting one of architecture's core figurative strategies to inspire complex ways of transforming both building culture and perception today. If anything, Anton's work radicalizes what el Khoury begins to theorize. Anton's own second doctoral thesis revolves around stressed mass, bringing our attention not only to the ways in which engineering has advanced structural agency, 
but also how this has enabled architectural strategies that require mass as the basis of their transformation, their communication, and function. Anton's architecture is serious, but it's also deadpan. There's no other way of interpreting his truffle, especially in the way that it is delivered in his now infamous video on, of its construction. It has gravitas and weight, metaphorically and literally, but also the lightness of being, which brings us to the main introduction of the evening. Tonight's speaker, Tomas Saraceno, is an expert on lightness, but with the same gravitas and weight of our interlocutor, Anton. Saraceno's structures are ephemeral, they're intricate, immaterial, and stubbornly light, refusing to be subordinated by the traditional mandates of tectonics. Not innocent to the protocols of architecture, this artist, if it is okay to reduce him to such a nomenclature, is in fact an architect. A graduate of the Universidad de Buenos Aires with a postgraduate degree in art and architecture in the Escuela Superior de Bellas Artes, Ernesto de la Karkova, and then again another postgraduate degree from the Staatliche Hochschule in Frankfurt, Tomas is, if, is, if anything, overeducated in architecture, something that gave way to his interest in the arts, but also offered an alternative path for architectural speculation, and this is important. I like to say that Saracena had to escape the architectural profession in order to undertake a more challenging and engaged architectural practice. But a practice that had as one of its core ambitions and motivations to demonstrate the very power of the architectural discipline in its ability to transform reality as we know it today. I will not belabor an analysis of his work. He will have the time to make his case himself. However, it may help to situate his work. As everybody knows, the architectural field has itself opened up many alternative practices in the past two decades, if not more, with the installation becoming one of its main protagonists, having even been institutionalized not only in various curricula, as we have here, but also memorialized in annual events such as the PS1 series. The work of Saracena may draw traction from this tradition, but it also should not be confused with it. While his work is parasitical to architecture, its best function is to challenge the very institution of art and architecture at the same time. His most recent work in Milan on space, time, foam is an exemplary piece of work in that beyond the material nature of the installation, which is in its own right quite sophisticated, it is an assault on perception, sensation, and effect on the one hand, but also on the other, a challenge to the very building type which is its host to the codes that regulate the building, to the social foundations that form how we use that space and how it's negotiated. In the tradition of Christo and Jean-Claude, one could claim that the work is not only invested in the architectural, but also in the political and bureaucratic protocols that define, limit, and give potential to the practice, whether that's the practice of architecture or art. However, in the hands of Saraceno, these parameters are led to dizzying and vertiginous results beyond that of his predecessors. With a disarming character, Saraceno is not only at ease with his imagination, but also with that of his collaborators. A militant collaborator, each project is precisely composed of a variety of players from different disciplines, from the arts, the sciences, and way beyond. He operates with methodologies that are at once systemic in their questions, but also open to empirical speculation, research, failure, and risk. Each project is an exercise that has not yet been rehearsed or choreographed. Much of it is, in, is tweaked and recalibrated on site with an eye towards public engagement and interaction. His work awaits you. With a repulsion towards the decorum of tour-guided protocols, his attitude is formed around pure physical engagement and negotiation, as if to use architecture and materiality to challenge social convention. And maybe it is exactly the frame of the art institution that can offer the suspension of disbelief to help radicalize not so much the mise-en-scene of Saraceno, but his veritable commitment to inventing new architectural frameworks. 
So without further ado, I have to say it is hard to imagine a more appropriate visitor to MIT culture for this occasion. And please help me to give a warm welcome to Tomas. Um, well, um, thank you uh, for the invitation. Uh, it's working, yes. The microphone, yes. Um, I have to um, go from the beginning. Let me put it here. One second. And then... Um, Thomas, I lowered the mic. You may want to bring it to your height. Ah, uh, yeah. But I think so. Ah, uh, hello? Hello? Yes. <laughs> now it's working. Um, no, um, a little bit like... A, uh, we said that maybe the lights, we, we will uh, dim them off a little bit. Then if somebody wants to sleep... <laughs> That's a good idea. No? At least I don't see you. you know? <laughs> but uh, okay, that's good. Um, no, and then the other thing is like uh, I, I, you know, I would like to say, um, I mean, thank you for all the the beautiful week, for all the beautiful words that I have uh, heard today and and during this week. And and I'm, I mean, the, the list of thanks is, I would say, really endless. And how inspiring have been to be here and still what is to come. But nevertheless, I mean, I think so. Today is a little bit. Um, I will try to say like it's more like a, again a kind of experiment. Uh, let's say I, I don't like to make presentation and try to explain my work. Or it's more about maybe what it come up to you and what you can imagine uh, about it. Uh, maybe it's a trigger of, of some kind of imagination that I think so all of us have somehow here or there. And then um, and then you know it's like the, maybe the capability to build something uh, in somehow together. You know, I always thought, like, I mean, I, I kind of like to put uh, um, troubles in myself in, in this case. You know, I know I have to stick it to, to half an hour. This mean it's now 6.52. I have to, to, to get there. But I have, like, I think, so 400 slides. This mean we, I always thought, like, you know, a way to interact between me, which is here, which is kind of uh, um, somehow boring also. But, uh, but it's to give to all of you kind of a remote control. Uh, and then we know that in half an hour we have to go through, that, through it. And this means, you know, when, I, when you start to get bored about what I'm talking about, it's like, you know, if all of you kind of click the button, you know, I will be forced to start to talk something else. And then it will be like kind of a very fast forward interaction between what, what you want me to talk, or, or at least there might be something related to the images. But, but uh, yeah, I have to maybe find next time like so many remote controls. But um, going back a little bit and, and, and maybe... Um, this mean any time also, I mean, uh, let's try, I don't know if it worked, but uh, um, maybe there is a way that you can, uh, I, mean, me, I mean, that was the streak to put down the light, not that I don't see you sleeping, but, but you can say, hey, come on, hurry up, or, or, or whatever is going there. But, uh, but I mean, the, the first sample may, maybe is a little bit, which is in the same line, which uh, I'm trying to, to kind of give this long introduction. Uh, is about this work, which somehow it's uh, is a uh, it's kind of a you know a closed loop or feedback loop or a kind of ecosystem, which somehow the the wind turbine hey, it work also like this. Uh, but when I put up, the, he promised the microphone will work in any position. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> when when uh, when the propeller is spin, somehow it charges the battery, and the battery it it it, uh, it make run the camera, and the camera take pictures. And, and it's somehow, you know, it's like a, the first kind of complicated thing is like a, uh, well, you know, it's like a, you want to take a picture, oh, that, that's a good frame to, to start the kind of a movie or, or whatever it might be. And, but actually, there is no wind. This means there will not be picture which will be running. And, uh, because basically, the, 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 every time that the, the kind of one of the blades go through this magnetic sensor, it, it's take a picture. Uh, this means, you know, it's a kind of more like an exercise to try to... Um, be myself maybe more patient or be surprised by things that I'm not able to see or to perceive. And it's all about this kind of extension or delay uh, which somehow the arts also would give me on the possibility to reinterpret something. I mean, w what it's happened at the end of the day is like a, uh, you know, it's like a, basically it's a time lapse, but it's based on the wind and the wind power, which by the way also give energy to, to the system. But, uh, you know, for example, you, you see the moon kind of very smooth going here, then it go very fast, the moon, and then the moon disappear, and then appear somewhere else in the scene, because there was no wind, right, for a period of time. This means it's always kind of, at this stage, uh, wind base, 
uh, the movie. And, you know, I'm always kind of curious somehow to, you know, when, when now in the newspaper appear kind of uh, how was the glacier, uh, I don't know, in the, in the 60s, uh, the level of the ice was much higher. And, and the picture which was taken at that moment was not conscious on the idea that now the ice is kind of melting. Does it mean there is kind of archival, uh, um, you know, or at least a kind of an attempt uh, that maybe, you know, I'm taking a picture of something which somehow I do not take the decision to see this, but somehow, you know, uh, maybe the, the wind took the decision to, to document this for then later, maybe in a couple of years, I, I will be able that something we, you don't think so might change, somehow it changed later. But anyway, uh, we, we, we go to, yeah, this is yeah, Bolivia. Uh, is the salty lake, and and again I think so. You know the, the, what it happened here is again I did I was not prepared for what it happened somehow. I mean, uh, and, and I let you your imagination also to follow again. I mean what it happened at night. I mean that that's a nice image and it's okay. Anyway, I was doing a video again here based on the system that I was trying to explain to you before, but during the night I you know there was not enough sensibility. But but what it happened. Um, well, we were sleeping up here for almost a month on the lake, and and then most of the time also there is this kind of foggy situation. And then, as you can see, there is some wrinkles and, and the water. It kind of you know, I mean, the deepness of the stars that you see reflected down in the in the in the sea in, in, in the floor is kind of pretty amazing. It's like a super perfect mirror. You think, oh, the mirror you know will not give the deepness of the of the constellation. Somehow you step like this, and then you all the I mean in the south and it's very, you say, three Marias, and it kind of start to wrinkle. I mean, there is a kind of pretty much a immersion somehow. And there is somehow also, let's try to maybe read this kind of reverberation or this kind of movement that somehow is also, maybe we try to interpret through some other samples and work. Uh, well, that's good. Well, and then back in, 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 in this installation, which is in Italy, which is somehow it happened the same what maybe it happened in, in, in the Salty Lake with the stars, but in this case it happened with, with other people. Uh, what it happened here is, um, let me put, let me go back in this one. I mean, you know, besides, like, you know, like if I move now, you will be moving. If you move, I will be moving. And then this kind of, uh, um, kind of, uh, uh, sharing of the space or the possibility to move and, and, and be moved by somebody who you don't expect. expect. But the, I think so the more uh, kind of funny part is like when somebody enters in the lower part, in the entrance, well, it's a big pressurized space. It doesn't mean when you enter in the lower space, you know, you got a very, got a, a, a very strong um, um, uh, wind which comes to you, and somehow you, you don't know what it happened. But the people which are on top, they say, hey, close the door! Because kind of everything, every, it collapsed the system, you know, it's a very quickly situation. Does it mean there is, the, again, you know, there is the engagement between the people which are kind of in, in different levels, but also with the people which enter down. And, and somehow you don't realize that, you know, how much the things are related, but, uh, but in somehow it works. Well, um, and then the other thing which was kind of a nightmare also is try to, to get the approval of how to, how to, to, get it, uh, to get it there. Because, I mean, our three layers, when you put a lot of pressure in the cube, which is 7,000 cubic of meter of, uh, of air, all the three layers are squeezed. I mean, I, I just explained it. I mean, I don't have a better method for that, like a lasagna, maybe, because I start to get angry, but <laughs> angry. But, uh, but, you know, there is no space in between all of them. This means when you enter with your own body, you kind of open the space. And as big as you are, or if you enter between two persons, then you kind of bend the space, you, you know, which drives kind of a very simple relationship with the theory of relativity of Einstein, you know, how much you have a mass of a body, somehow all people will go, or planets will, will kind of uh, bond one to each other. But, you know, the, the more complicated it was to try to speculate that if it's going to work or not, because, you know, when you have somebody on top, for example, uh, it's going to squeeze you. This doesn't mean you have to move to the other level. And when you are here, you squeeze the other one, which is below. This means there is a lot of synchronicity between how people it moves and, 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 and how much is affected. Uh, you know, this, I mean, I'm, I'm passionate about the butterfly effect and how, how we might relate one to each other. Here, here are people up here. I will not go back to that one, but... Uh, well, this is a drawing by Paul Davis when he, he tried to talk about a, a space-time form a, more in a quantum scale. And, you know, it's still kind of in a, it's a dimension which is kind of passionate me. I try to understand it and maybe 
to reinterpret in some, some way. Let me get, I mean, here is also, I mean, this guy is pretty much in trouble because he cannot go out from, from, from the installation. <laughs> This I mean, it's again, you know, it's like, a, 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 you know, there is a lot of security which we try to avoid it, but, you know, for these men to go out, somebody else has to go to the bottom of the installation, and then he will be lifted up, and then he can get the staircase and go, and, and go out. This means uh, it, it takes a while, a little bit, until you learn, you know, how, you know, uh, and then the other, I mean, the, another thing which happened usually, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty much, you know, at the beginning, uh, when was during the installation, uh, we try to make a manual of how to use it because nobody really it kind of is a constant learning process for me and for the people who somehow have to take care. But uh, you know, another thing is like people usually like to be together in a space. But when you be together in a space, it kind of it really go deep, much more than this. This I mean, it's very difficult to escape from this kind of black hole situation. <laughs> there we are. That was the first time that I entered kind of alone, and this guy tried to come and rescue me, but. <laughs> But, but I didn't disappear <laughs> yet. Anyway, one of the ideas, and I think so also when, when I came to the, when, well, I received the invitation of MIT, which somehow was a dream, also like a, a student, you know, Yula Kosic, one of my former uh, professors, always say, well, well, you have to go and study and say, well, go to MIT. And somehow I didn't make it, but I'm so happy to be here today. But, uh, you know, the, the, then the idea, I mean, the way how we build this, uh, this work, this kind of membrane, let's, let's put it in, in that way, is like then later we might be able to uh, fill it up with uh, hydrogen, and then um, the idea that it will be float, uh, right? Uh, well, there are these floating islands, and, and here it is, well, something like this. We, we are thinking maybe we will go to the Maldives island, and um, which... When they, they said with the best uh, time, maybe, maybe 15, 20 years that they kind of uh, sink down there. And then, you know, we are trying to kind of um, um, coordinate them. And then, you know, the, there is, we were talking today uh, about the idea to add some desalinization system, very, very primitive of how we might be able to chill out up here, but at the same time drinking water and at the same time try to talk or enlarge the dialogue of the peace that kind of engage in the kind of uh, situation inside and how we might confront with another scenario which have more uh, maybe latent uh, uh, concern. But nevertheless, I mean, it, to go back this, it's, you know, I'm kind of um, uh, enthusiastic to try to uh, think uh, that this might be one of the clouds or might be one of the, the, the ideas of how we might be able uh, to shape or to think about, uh, or, and I also to expand, you no, know, the same as Bad Minister Führer has said, you know, we are on a spaceship Earth, you know, spinning around the sun, and all the time there is this kind of uh, idea to expand the concept of, of thinking like a cloud city in kind of a multiple scales, and, and, but it also go back to the interpretation of uh, what, it, what might be, uh, where they might be. And, um, but, but basically what, what I'm thinking very easily, I, we were in, in the Department of Planetary and Earth and Science, and then it was kind of pretty interesting also the speculation that we were saying, because, you know, I mean, the, my first question will be is like, a, is it possible that to, you know, like a kind of an in, in architectural scale or, or kind of, uh, you know, I just borrow the classification of the clouds to try to simulate how it might be like a kind of a style in architecture, like a Romani, Gothic or whatever, and say like, a, okay, cumulonimbus city or stratunimbus city or, or cirrus or, or whatever, and try to see if, I mean, the, the question that I posed them it was, was saying like, a, could we imagine that if, if cities are built, let's say like a, um, each of these spheres is a house and then, you know, we can kind of agglomerate one to each other. It's kind of a kind of big mobility of cities. It, it might resemble how clouds we, uh, as we see them today. Does it mean it might move this particle in a certain way uh, if we have neutral buoyancy uh, that somehow uh, it might form as the clouds form based also on the decision that we might have that we want to be a neighborhood one, you know, on the way from here to South America and then back, you know, that we can choose the path somehow. And then we said, like, maybe there are some small chamber that we can drive with some particle and see if this simulation of this kind of understanding of possible cloud city might, might be on that way. Well, this is some of the interior. I think with Skylar also was pretty interesting, the conversation of how these things might come together. Well, you know, I'm, I'm very fan of, of the idea to try to promote, again, the idea of the biosphere, the biosphere too, which was in Arizona, and how we might be able maybe to build the biosphere uh, again, but in this case floating in the air. 
and to scale, well, that my different situation here in this case, you know, I'm trying to collect, uh, with there are kind of flexible solar panel in the middle, some miler fall on the side, and somehow when, when the sun hit, it kind of uh, focus or, or help to concentrate the sun in the middle, and then it keep going. It's a kind of more structure of how I think, so, you know, it could, uh, it could come together. It's a little bit more technical, but, uh, you know, there are each sphere, which somehow, you know, what, what I'm finding out is much more easy to use a simple, simple kind of uh, geometry, and then when you join one to each other, somehow it closes the gap. And then what I'm thinking, and it basically is a, the same concept of a wheel of a bicycle, but in three dimensions. And when you pull them all together, somehow it gets, and you can enter inside, of, of in, kind of in the hub, uh, in, in between the, the space. It's not floating, it's hanging on the tree, but <laughs> hopefully we, we would, could get up in the future. Well, this is kind of the same, also was, in this case it's also a little bit, was more difficult when, when the people are up there because uh, they could not see really what's going on there. This means when, when, again, you know, it's all these kind of pressurized spaces, it's pretty challenging to, to understand how the dynamics are in between, in between the people. Well, then what I, well, I, I've been working then with uh, Phil and Byron from the Trinity, Trinity College and then uh, University, and uh, you know, I've, I've been obsessed quite, quite a lot on the idea of how spheres pack one to each other and the kind of the optimization between the volume and the surface and how we could uh, manage to, you know, just to, to get to a, a scale, maybe I try to go how they could connect one to each other, which somehow, you know, it go back to the piece which is now at, at the Metropolitan. This is a little bit kind of larger scale. In this case, at 22 meter, meter each. And here you go to the, to the Met. These were kind of pretty smaller. And all the time, you know, a little bit the reference also was like, a, you know, it's like a, what is kind of, a, kind of a, a sundial somehow they work, which is somehow, you know, when the sun hit one of the mirror, somehow the sight of this kind of a possible huge solar clock at the building which are around. And then we speculate a little bit more if, you know, I'm kind of pretty fan of Don Petty, the astronaut, which is usually uh, make very funny uh, experiment on, on uh, International Space Station, if he might be able to see the sunlight also traveling to that distance. This, I mean, I was pretty much concentrated on, on the piece, but at the same time, how you might be able uh, other people to perceive it. Uh, this. And it is again, you know, the position of this reflective surface was again trying to bring back this experience from Ujuni, you know, from Bolivia, where you kind of, uh, you know, it's a kind of a challenge to try to perceive how many uh, reality you can see at the same time and move. I mean, to, to bring it kind of a, a, a larger scale, uh, it was a little bit too, too you know, I mean, but basically what he speculated is like if we have a 1.2 miles diameter sphere with one degree of temperature between the inside and the outside, you might be able to lift it up in the air, taking into account the volume of the structure and, 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 and all the, the material. This I means it's pretty important, you know, how big, you know, it's not that I'm obsessed to do big things, but somehow if you want to try to fly only with solar energy and be up only by the, by the sun, it, it kind of needs to, to get a little bit big and then there is this kind of speculation to try to bring down the sun when many spheres are connected together. I mean, the, the very simple sample is like play with the laser and see how it kind of bounces back and then you kind of reach up there and then try to get it also in a kind of, in another scale of, of, of dialogue. Well, this, uh, but, and the other reason is like that I'm partially from Argentina and I like to eat barbecue and I thought, well, that would be funny to have a kind of a huge solar cooking on top of the mat and people could go there and hang the sausage and then kind of, <laughs> kind of eat them. And this is kind of a, a, a solar cooking uh, that we are trying to, to cook a chicken, which is hanging up there <laughs> in the Atelier Calder. Um, well, here we get to another dimension. And here is, a, this is one of these uh, solar balloons, which I said, there are not many built in the world. Uh, this you can build it like a, if you are two or three people, one weekend for $300. Uh, you can more or less put a man up in the air only by solar energy. What I mean, solar energy that is, is really the sun who heat up the interior of this. Uh, is a, this is polyethylene 50 microns. It's the normal uh, trash can. Uh, I mean, this plastic, which is over there, is kind of similar to this one. Yeah, it's not more thick than this. It's even a little bit thinner. And we tape it together. And I think so at the moment there are eight in the world who could... Uh, who have been built uh, based somehow in this terrain. This is a little bit more particular because we use this pentagon and hexagon, which is the idea to incorporate aerogel to get more thermal 
resistant and to be longer because every time they come a cloud, which somehow I like to think cloud city, but you go down, you know. <laughs> this is mean. But you know, the idea is also you, we will be above the level of the cloud. This mean that is a kind of a, and, and kind of move at a certain speed. And you can regulate the altitude also opening and closing. No, you get a cord in the middle. This mean you can go up and down also. Let it the, the hot air go through. Um, here, here's the interior. Where is the rope that you, you pull? This is more similar to a, a hot air balloon. Uh, well, this is kind of a, a project which I'm part of somehow. I'm, it's kind of a collaborative, let's put it, a platform. It's called Musero Solar. At the moment, it might change to something else. And uh, yeah, that's a kind of funny statistic. No, it costs more to recycle back than to produce a new one. It's a harsh economy because bag recycle costs 4,000 to recycle one ton of plastic, which can then be sold for a commodity 32. Oh my God, that's crazy. Anyway, um, well, by the end, you know, they end up in the vortex of Pacific with all the plastic bag and, and there. But and then what we start to do is like kind of a, a collect plastic bag. It's kind of a, it, the, the, the project kind of grow always somehow through a conversation. Um, and, and then we, we kind of tape them and then yeah, it goes up again with the, with the sun and different shapes. And, and there are different teams in different parts of the world which somehow, you know, sometimes we get together and then this kind of museum, a collection of plastic bag keep expanding. And, and somehow, you know, it's like a, there always a kind of a different meaning of how you might interpret. And also the capability to see that, to see kind of a, a co super commercial uh, uh, trade name, uh, how it get completely decontextualized when it travels to another country. I always say the sample, we, we were in, uh, in, in France and then, uh, I don't know, it's like, a, what is a common supermarket chain here in America? What will be? Star Market. Star Market. Yeah, Star Market. Star, or Target or something like sure. this, right. Yeah. right. You know, and then, you know, you, you are in a country that tape, taping target, 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 target. It's like Andy Warhol seems like I'm, you know, in a kind of another direction. But, but it's somehow, you know, even this kind of completely popular trade name, when, it, when the, the experience that I received is like we, we, we went to then to Paris and then somebody was laying down there and said, wow, that's a super cool label record from the 60s and was target in Colombia. You know what I mean? It's like, a, you know, it's like a... It means also, the, you know, when you think like kind of is a super globalized interpretation of, of things, I, I think so. And it always depends about the distance that you see because, you know, it's somehow when you, at that distance, I don't read anymore the label, right? And when it's flying up there, it also it kind of, uh, and, and, and mostly, you know, it's about the idea, you know, to reusing, no? I mean, when, when the museum went to Cuba also, they, they, they have a super highly um, consciousness of reuse the plastic bag, no? And, and, and not maybe to recycle, which is kind of uh, different. I mean, and the pos potentiality that plastic bag have somehow to, to last. What well, that's a little bit another project, I don't know if I, I will end up here, but, uh, but was more a, 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 there was a competition in architecture, which, as they said, uh, had been formed, and then was the idea of proposing a, a mobile clinic for prevent HIV in Africa. And then I thought, like, uh, well, one of the, the methods that today exist is, uh, is a condom, right? and to, to, to blow it up, and then the, the idea that also, you know, it could uh, somehow reach also uh, some destination which sometimes is difficult to be reached, and at the same time kind of uh, maybe, you know, engage the dialogue in a kind of a different system. You know, my father was all the time kind of working for uh, United Nations, and, and I've been growing up like going to developing countries, and, you know, the, the, the first thing I thought, like, you know, let's say, the European Union will arrive with a small track and saying, well, today we will talk about HIV or how to prevent and left and right. And, and then, you know, it's like in, in this kind of maybe cultural context, you know, people, they do not even talk about sex, which is most of the case in some of these uh, countries. This, I mean, imagine opposite, you know, like arriving on a, kind of a huge uh, kind of, and you don't know even if it's, it's a condom, you know, it's kind of, it might be kind of driving some attention you know, people coming to the square, getting up in the thing, and you know, it's like maybe engage people in kind of an another level of conversation and how they could uh, um, um, appropriate or, or think about something. Mm, these are, I will kind of skip it. And maybe the, the one of the, well, there was a the piece in Venice which somehow started with the idea to, to kind of uh, re reinterpret. Uh, I mean, what, what was, was mostly was this idea of, um, which, I, which I kind of read all the time, was about the idea of that many scientists use, or, or writers, or, 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 or 
astrophysicians also, they always talk about the origin of the universe or the cosmic web. As, and then the best analogy that they find is always in relationship with a, with a, with a spider web and a three-dimensional spider web. This means what, what it happened is, um, you know, I, I got very simple. Here is it, uh, Volker Springler from Max Planck Institute. We went there, we visited him, we started to talk about him, and they have drawn this thing which is called the Millennium Simulation, which is the more, somehow the more precise uh, simulation of the origin of the universe, uh, and then kind of keep actualizing all the time. And then, well, what we did, we just bought like a kind of a, a black widow who came to the studio, and we put it inside a box, uh, trying to think that uh, by reproducing a, a kind of a, or try to, to kind of rebuild a three-dimensional spider web, we may understand something in relationship of how the geometry of the universe uh, is done. This means what, what we did then in one moment also with Peter Yeager from the Sinkenberg Museum, uh, it's kind of famous arachnologist. What we try to do is kind of a hybrid also between um, different spider. We, we put first a black widow who make a kind of type of web, then we took out the black widow and we put a tegenari on top. And then it was kind of force uh, animals which are kind of solitary, they're not social, they do not build well together, but how one species will build a web on top of the other web. And then it was pretty interesting. And then they acknowledged, say, wow, that will be interesting. Anyway, we, we got very concentrated also to try to build only one. Here we are in computer tomography, try to read it. You know, the, the thickness of the spider web is 0 0.00, 1,000 of a millimeter. And the, and the, the best uh, machines that we could find, and I think so there are no, no best, not, not, not micro CT scan, but a, a kind of this scale or, or you know, the dimension of the, of the spider web, uh, yet you, you could not read it. This means, you know, we start to ask to a lot of laboratories and, and, and one of the most specialized, if I'm not wrong, is, is Samuel Chokel from a, um, for a university in Basel. He's a very keen person on understanding. What they were doing, try to also, I mean, spider webs, you can always divide it in B-dimensional and three-dimensional. It's kind of not very scientific, but they, it's kind of used always. I mean, it's never B-dimensional because there was always some variation. But uh, what we figure, figured out that nobody have ever uh, scanned a three-dimensional spider web or kind of digitalized or tried to understand more precise the merging properties of a, of a three-dimensional spider web. This means, you know, the exhibition was coming up. You have to present it. In the Venice Biennale was, uh, was uh, this invitation, and we could not find even a method to, to start to scan it for then be able to rebuild it. This means one day what we were doing... Ah, here, was with a laser scan, just illuminate one of the boxes, and then when you illuminate with the scans, you can see exactly the intersection point with the laser and the web. This means based on this, then we went to the Senckenberg Museum, uh, to the um, um, Technical University in Darmstadt, to the Photogrammetry Institute, and then we asked them to kind of help us to uh, make this uh, photogrammetry uh, system where we will take, uh, you know, in parallel into machine. I mean, it's a, it's a project that took two years to, to realize this. It was a quite a uh, long process. Here are some of the slides. Here are all these kind of um, um, parts of the, of the scan. And then even we were trying to make many scripting in the computer and, and try to kind of uh, connect some of the end uh, uh, um, threats. Um, and uh, uh, finally, we have to do it all by hand because it was never working so properly, the scripting. And then based on this, then we, 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 the idea was kind of somehow building it. Um, this means we got this kind of enormous amount of, of numbers and, and nodes and intersections. And then, <laughs> I, I mean, I, we, we can drive then later exactly how we do it. But, you know, every time that there is a two or more lines reaching to a point, we put a, a vertical, I mean, we print all the nodes on the floor and on the ceiling. Uh, this means we know exactly where the nodes are happening. And then what we put a nylon line uh, at the high where the nodes are, and then we start to build from one node to another node from and here. Because what it happened, you know, when you pull one thread, this thread might bifurcate in three, and then in four, and in five. This means it's very difficult if you don't have the exactly position on space all the time where the nodes are located, it's very easy then to pull and to deform all the net uh, in another position. This means the nylon threads, and then you have to navigate kind of <laughs> through, through, through the web also, which uh, was pretty complicated. Here you, you can see mostly how was that, no? It comes from, from the floor and, and how somehow it starts to elevate up in the three-dimensional space. Yeah. <laughs> 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 was, was 
Oh, it was endless work. I mean, it was winter outside, snow, and then we had to heat it up there. And also, I mean, I'm, I'm now I think so. On Monday, I meet somebody here at MIT who specializes on spiders, and I'm, I'm very interested to start to see and to share some knowledge, and maybe I can give them the data of, of, of this uh, uh, spider web and then see how it's going. Now, yeah, people were able to enter also. Uh, what it happened later, you know, it's like, a, I mean, there was many kind of disciplines working on it. Each of them make their own scientific paper on the, the ones who kind of uh, helped to develop the, 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 the kind of the system to, to make the, the scan. Uh, Peter Yeager from the St. Gabriel Museum presented the project in a paper in a Congress, a uh, World Congress of Arachnology in Poland. Um, then when, when I meet Gilles Clement uh, from, uh, um, he, he do, uh, he's responsible of a, lo a lot of life science experiment on the International Space Station when I was at NASA in 2009. And he said, oh, you managed to scan a three-dimensional spider web. I said, well, yeah, why, why don't send it to ISS, no? And then I said, wow, that's fantastic because somehow it might kind of send spider back to space and see how, because before it was not sent, I mean, spider had been in space and in a microgravity environment, but always B-dimensional, never three-dimensional. Since they could not really study them, they will not make sense maybe to compare them. But somehow also what I, what I and then, you know, we supply this and we keep going on. Now there is somebody in Japan which is very obsessed about like uh, that all uh, kind of connection are planar and not happening in a three-dimensional place. This means he's writing another, uh, uh, paper on kind of the in, a different interpretation of, of the same work, but what somehow it, it kind of a, all the time kind of fascinated me is uh, is the idea. You know, it's like a you know a, a, a was beautiful talk with Jerry Friedman the other day in in his laboratory. You know, say, and, and it's something that he all the time also say. You know, like a, we know only four percent. You know, things that we have named ninety six percent is still is black matter or dark energy, and all the rest is four percent. The human, the planets, the hydrogen, the helium, and I mean, and you might know much better than me what's going on there. But somehow the, the analogy that. Uh, people have found to try to explain the origin of the universe is kind of three-dimensional spider web, which somehow you can find in every corner of a house, which at some, the same time was so less studied maybe as we know how the universe is done somehow. You know, I kind of like this kind of uh, knowing the unknowing, the unknowing, the unknowing, the analogy that you find also is less known than what you thought also at the beginning. Uh, well, this will be the, the, the papers and the, well, and this is one of the I think so, the last images, where we are kind of trying to build again the space elevator based on, on, on some ideas down there. But I think so, that's it. I think so, more or less, I made it on time. And thank you. Anton, I will let you lead the questions, and then I will hold them back from this side as you, as you start. <laughs> okay, Tomas. Uh, I think there's something that you can't avoid. Yeah. Is that you were trained as an architect. Mm -hmm. So that leads us some questions about your, in my point of view, main uh, work environment. You, you operate in space. Oh. But you are, mm, you are erasing part of the, let's say, Vitruvian principles, no? Oh. The gravitas, firmitas, oh. no? The utilitas. And, uh, and in this uh, reinterpretation of, oh. of our physical world, in that slight line no? between what's distinguished our own physicity and the experience no? in these borders where you operate. No? Oh. Uh, my question is that there's always the presence of the existing, the real space. No? Oh. Somehow you need this presence to 
to uh, express or to materialize uh, the immaterial? It's a <laughs> That's the question. <laughs> That's a question. Um, um, no, I, I think so. I get more in trouble also, like to to define what is material and what is not material. I kind of maybe one step backward, and then it's always like a you know, uh, what is the process that you could invent yourself to kind of uh, delay this capability of perceiving. Uh, you know, and to try to take into account uh, which are the players, and somehow you know the pieces. Somehow also it, it kind of a, a trigger this idea of extending my capability, or maybe the capability of the other ones, of how much role it, it plays. You know, it's like a, um, I, I don't know. It's like, a, for example, in, in, in the piece in Italy, you know, it's like a, I mean, it's very simple, but you know, it's like there are some uh, some actors. Uh, let's put it on on, on more. Uh, in, in the way of how Bruno Latour tried to, to define the, you know, the, the kind of the, how much, you know, the accountability of the environment or in the, in the, and when we, you know, it's like a, I don't know, I always kind of uh, try to delay. I mean, the, I, now I forgot the writer of, of he was um, living in Argentina for quite a long time, but he all the time said like, look, if I manage to concentrate myself for 30 minutes just looking at this glass and now, and I do this exercise just to look at this, my life will be completely different. You know, and, and I completely agree on this. You know, it's like, a, it's like how much I extend, can, ex, can I extend myself, um, my ability to, to, to look at something, right? And this, it might change again. And then, you know, it's like, a, I, I don't know if really answered the question, but uh, that's something which can ob obsess me somehow. But to, to some degree, uh, it begs a follow-up question of who you think your audience is. Often, as architects, you operate in two worlds. One, you build buildings for the general public, uh, for people to work in, to rebel in, to demonstrate in. In other words, it has many publics. But another level of discourse, one could say, is a meta-discourse. You design for a particular audience, even, not even all architects, you may be... For spiders. <laughs> <laughs> or, or for people, or, I don't know, people who, people who build parallel universes, I don't know. <laughs> Do you have a, an audience that is internal to your circle, whether it's art historical or whether it's architects, but they are the, the bearers of a certain discourse to which you compete with, aspire to, etc. Mm. Um, not really, I think so. And I hope so. I will never have it, like so classified somehow. Um, um, you know, it's like all the time, uh, you know, it, I hope so, you know, it's like a, um, um, how to say, it's like a, well, I always think like, a, you know, I'm, I'm kind of always fascinated, you know, how in internet have been invented. And let's put like this membrane, let's put it like it's more like a platform for people then to kind of engage maybe in the construction of something, which might be like a kind of, and the architecture I'm interested in, kind of a social space who might engage people in kind of a, a sharing a, some possibility of, 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 of thinking about something. But, uh, but is um, the, the audience, I mean, I'm my audience all the time. You know, I cannot separate so much. And also I cannot separate so much, you know, disciplines. I'm kind of much more interested in to kind of read what is in between. Or let's say I'm not so much interested, oh, I'm an architect or an artist. Well, what we have in common more, yeah. that we might operate together and do something. That, you know, that's what struck me much more. And, 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 and what make us, you know, do this spider web? I mean, their acknowledges might be interesting in something. I will have another sensibility, but somehow we could collaborate all together and, and manage to do it. Uh, and each of us, you know, then the scientists made their papers. I did were part of the exhibition and, and something like this. But the audience uh, in this case was is very uh, diverse. And, 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 you know, and as more, more successful, let's say, I will feel myself is how much we can engage in a kind of a possible dialogue. And that's what, for me, is architecture. Is architecture is not like the construction of space. Architecture, you can say, expand it to the construction of a poetry, the architecture of poetry, the architecture of a, a computer system, the architecture of a musical piece. Or, or but, but you do make choices 
for instance, at some point you had to decide whether the spider web was this thin or that thick. So mm. there, there are certain a prioris that go with certain specifications mm. against which you critique yourself. And this inv invariably involves a larger discourse. So it's, it, I'm, basically I'm asking how you insert yourself into those critical decision-making processes. But I think so. I, I, I never do them alone somehow. Um, well, I hope so. I mean, the first thing, why we choose a black widow? Because it was the, um, I mean, at the beginning it was it's supposed to be the piece which goes to Venice. And the black widow have a kind of configuration which somehow have kind of a very chaotic, I mean, all that technology gets completely pissed on me because we put the black widow upside down, how we present it. Anyway, they see how I, Spiders are always happening. You know, we have a kind of internal discourse or dispute about why the spider is presented the opposite. But first was, you know, let's choose a, a, a type of spider uh, who, who the geometry also will allow people to walk through. And somehow it will get entangled somehow, but also it moves. This means the decision in that case was together with uh, Peter Jäger. Um, then this decision of the material, you know, each... Uh, did the spider determine the geometry or did you edit and uh, editorialize uh, so, some of no, the... No, we have many. I mean, we have like a, maybe 15 or 20 boxes. This is mean in some moment, yes, we decided which one is the more beautiful. I mean, completely mm -hmm. conscious. And then also when we try to mix this hybrid spider or, or make spider collaborate on one web on top of the other web also, you know, we say, oh, that... That's, I mean, let's start for something more simple, and then hopefully the next we can make more hybrid. But, uh, but also it was very complicated. I mean, it was trial and error, trial and error. You know, it's like a spy, at least the Black Widow, I think, so I have seven different uh, uh, types of threads, one which is more elastic, the other one who have their configuration. And it was very complicated to, I mean, all the threads, we will do a system which is too flexible, uh, it was very difficult to calibrate. This, I mean, we make all the lines are non-elastic, but the nodes and when they connect are elastic. This means mm -hmm. it gives some kind of flexibility to the system still to, to kind of uh, uh, have this ability to, to kind of keep the nodes in the space. You, it was really interesting that you showed us the, the process uh, to write, for example, to the spider web project in a very scientific method. Mm. Uh, but uh, I think that uh, Behind that scientific method, there's the desire mm. of, of, of managing the uncertainty of, of everything that happens no? uh, to, to really manipulate. No? So uh, it seems kind of a contradiction between the final result of your work with the way you show the, a very scientific process no? ah. in the middle. <laughs> and I think it's uh, yeah. the... the, the the attractive of, yeah. of it, no? Mm. Yeah, mm. Right. Could you explain mm. how, you, how mm. you manage, no? In, in all that long, <laughs> uh, two years yeah. scanning process of yeah. the web with all these yeah. scientists yeah. taking pictures, yeah. Yeah. and yeah. finally yeah. when you'd go and work. Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, it's like, I mean, the, what I start is like a kind of a, um, I mean, it might be, comp you know, when you talk with the arachnologist, you say, hey, I want to build a spider web because I'm interested in the universe. And I'm trying, you know, and then I show the Millennium Simulation that I acknowledged, I could not find a spider who made the universe. You know, like I have nothing to do with this analogy that others, yes, give it for granted. But at the same time, you know, uh, and this, you know, I, I come, you know, my, my saying, hey, but let's try it first because you are saying that it's not similar, but actually you never even scan it at, at, at this stage. This means it's also like a kind of a, you know, and now maybe we can compare with a little bit more level of precision between both. And I kind of maybe explain you again in a kind of... Uh, but I will never put it, I mean, once again, it's like I'm not interested to say, oh, I explained to you in a scientific method, or I explained to you in an artistic method. I think so what unifies us is this passion, this curiosity, this interest, this like, oh, let's do it. I don't care in the way how I do it. I, I, at least I don't ask myself. How I do I think you know it's like a, that's what I think so it kind of blur disciplines also and blur uh, you know the wish of doing something you know I don't know that uh, that's what I, as I as I found it somehow yeah but me. in that blur you are yeah. proposing a new ways of occupying space no uh, by the presence of that structure that constructs and yeah. somehow genera generates a, a landscape that conditions that constraints 
yeah. experience, no? yeah. the way you inhabit it. Yeah. In, in the project in Milan, mm. Mm. you were t telling about mm. the full social experience of rebalancing, mm. Mm. of c uh, close that mm. door, no? mm. because that uh, mm. Mm. different of pressure was generating mm. the mm. movement of people. Mm. No? Mm. Mm. There's, a, there's a full narrative in, yeah. in, uh, in all that yeah. scientific process. No? Yeah. I'm not wrong, but you know, I like sometimes when I think it's like, what the hell is space? You know, I don't know. That's the only problem that I mean, I'm stopped even before. You know, it's like, and then I read string theory, and then you know, David, uh, Brian Greene is always explaining the other, another dimension because the spider is able to walk in a cable in a, in a kind of a multiple dimension. Then I make the parabolic flight, and you are floating up there. You know, it's like I don't know what the hell is, is still space somehow, and I don't know how many damn dimension you might be able to keep finding and keep expanding my imagination to try somehow to, not even to translate, but I think so to build together a kind of an imaginary uh, capability to expand uh, also, you, you know, the, the way how we, how we see the things, you know, and, how, and, and, you know, and I think so it's a lot of influence also of the things that, 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 uh, that then later come up with something which it, it may be talk a lot about architecture and, and, and how we navigate on, on the space, but you know, for example, space in the membranes, no? on these kind of brains or whatever, if we want to use more this cosmic scale, uh, it doesn't exist. You know, again, this lasagna, it doesn't exist. I'm fascinated about the idea that, hey, you enter up here and you, you, you open it, you open the space, and then you move up here and the space follows you. I mean, that's, for me, in architectural terms, is fantastic. It's a space who does not exist, that with my body, it opened the space. It's very ecology, very kind of perfect. I don't want more space than the one that I need with my own weight. Does it mean I open it up, the space follows me. It's like a science fiction movie for me. <laughs> Every time that I go there, I'm like, oh, my God, you know, it's like, and then... I think so that I can open the space. Oh, fancy enough. Now, it come these guys, and I close my space, and I have to move it to the other side. I mean, what the hell is space? You know, it's like, a, it's some, it, you know, I don't, I, I, I don't know. But, but I, you know, it's like a, you know, it's a pure negotiation between you, the other one, the other one is on top, the other one who forgot the door open and say, and because this is what it happened. You somehow you learn, okay, that the space is something that we can share. You know, that's something which, you know, I love the analogy to say, well, I invent all a kind of whatever architecture is, but to try to kind of promote this idea to, you know, that you know, when you're a kid, you always walk alone. When you're in a bike, you bike alone. Well, sometimes in a tandem, but not, that, you know. But, but also, like, how much you can invent a space which somehow, you know, there is this kind of very straightforward influence of the way how I move, it influences the way you move, and how you move, I move. And I don't know, it's, that, that's something which, you know, is a, the space is all the time invented and reinvented by the way of how you interact with each other somehow. Maybe I get lost, I don't know what I want to say, but, but maybe it was something. Yeah. Are you willing at any cost to fulfill the, this kind of experiments that motivate these kind of social engagements without any friction of geometry and those other things that you hold dear from your background in architecture? Yeah, hey, once again, you know, it's like, hey, I'm always struggling about geometry, you know? I love topology, let's let put it that way, you, that you can, and, and I think so in all the material that I use, somehow they have a kind of, a, and I know the stone in kind of one billion years will change as an elastic, but, but you know, like, for example, it, the, the materials that I work, let's say, I would like to rather call them like a, a, it depends, I mean, and also it's kind of wrong to try to say what I said before, because let's put it that way, if we, you know, the same air that you breathe somehow influence the space that you are navigating up, up there. And I like the idea, you know, when, when Fuller also think about this huge monster uh, sphere, uh, it's just like a, by one degree of temperature between the inside and the outside, the sphere will elevate. This is mean like a, I'm trying to transform me something which kind of a, in a very kind of a scale which somehow is, I, you know, by the same breathing of people, this, the, the building will start to fly. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and then it's kind of this, how much the action of each singular person somehow doing maybe something together, it might change the way how we uh, learn to live on the big spaceship Earth, let's put it that way. But, 
but but it you know it's always uh, I mean the geometry that you, for for example this uh, the, the installation in Venice galaxy forming along spider web, like a drop of water on a spider web which is the title of this paper when they try to explain the galaxy you know it, each single thread you have in mind no there was this kind of sphere uh, which inside was another sphere and sphere all made of elastics no does it mean uh, when you pull one thread this the sphere, let's put this geometry kind of the form, it really depends the tension that you put in each single part which somehow it composes something. And again, mm -hmm. I, I, it's beautiful in the text of Latour, this idea of composition. No? It, it's something that, you know, you know, it's something that you, you build or you put more pressure in, 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 in that, in the membrane. Which shape have the membrane? It does not have a shape. The only, what I could tell you is like a, Yes, have shapes, but uh, because this idea of you know, five people in a thing is make this black hole that you cannot go out. Mm. Does it mean, but it's a shape which all the time changes, constantly, constantly. I mean, how, which shape have the air? Or, you know, it's like, I don't know. I mean, you can constrain somehow to try to give it some dimension, but. Uh, what you've mentioned Latour on a couple of occasions, and, and yesterday I believe you, you referred to Adorno. Mm. And so naturally there's an intellectual framework around mm. which you build some of your work. Mm. Uh, we, we didn't get to, to elaborate much on Adorno, but I, immediately I thought from my own readings about the critical function of art mm. or in its, and in its negational aspects mm. to, to, to reality as we know it. Mm. You've resisted on many occasions in these discussions to, to codify, to categorize, and to classify. Mm. But at the same time, you, uh, lurking behind the scenes, there is a, uh, you're using art to instigate, to, to uh, resist something. Mm. Can you clarify uh, in your mind, either from a, an intellectual pedigree, mm or from, again, a more intuitive motivation, where you, what do you think the function of art is? Can somebody help me? <laughs> 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 I say I need help today. <laughs> I have... You said I don't know, I didn't. <laughs> uh, this in collective intelligence. You know? <laughs> uh, no, what, no, the only, like, what, what was, like, was a conversation which I have with Daniel Libensky. Actually, you know what it happened, like, an architect somehow lately, it was last week in, 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 um, in Berlin, which, uh, and, and, and my wife is always telling me, you see, stick with the architects, that's the one who are inviting you, and I'm so glad that they, I'm here, thanks to you, right? It's like, don't treat bad your own discipline, you know. <laughs> <laughs> No, but I, I, besides this, I'm, I'm very grateful. But um, no, I, I, what, what I remember is like more, I, I mean, at least into the, into the art scene, which I do not find maybe so much the discourse into the architecture, is this capability to the acceptance of failure, which always Adorno said, you know, is one of the, um, is one of the constitutes, is, I mean, it's something that you, no lo puedes anticipar, you cannot put it as a, it's a condition, but you cannot put it, anticipate it, on, 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 not put it on front. And I see many times into, uh, you know, like even talking with artists, mostly, more, more than architecture, because maybe, maybe in, in art, no? Maybe because in architecture you have the responsibility that is a building that have to stand, that, you know, there is something that, uh, the failure is something that, I mean, you, you, you cannot talk op so openly uh, talk about it. But in the art world, you know, sometimes, and now I'm trying to define, to divide it, the things that I didn't want it, but um, was this uh, mostly acceptance to say, well, it doesn't work well, but you know, it's like Adorno said, it, it could fail, you know, and to be art, I have to fail. This is one of the responsibility of, mm -hmm. no? but you cannot put it on, 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 on the front. And I think so mostly for me is more the ability to say like, a, a, if, I, if I use this pretext that it, it might allow to fail, uh, I kind of, uh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not so persistent and consistent and, and kind of, uh, um, this mean it's something which I... And it, in this uh, allowance to failure, is it a matter of scale? Because now you are thinking about mm. 1.2 kilometer dome, mm. flying structures. Mm. Mm. You, you're, yeah. you're getting dangerously close to architecture. Yes, eh? yes. 
uh, of we, the universe, we, eh? not of the series. Of the <laughs> we, don't, we don't want you to be an architect. Eh? We want you to, to stay as you are. No, eh? no. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, there's a scale of intervention, yeah. Yeah. of space modification, of yeah. action that does not resist failure. Mm. Mm. No, I mean, what, what, I, what I do is like, how, how beautiful, I mean, what also is like, and, and this was so beautiful talk with you the other day, you know, it's like there is this kind of problem, let's say, of, uh, of scales again. Uh, but, uh, wow. <laughs> No, of, you know, when I, I mean, this was, was nice the other day when, when we, we were talking, it's like, you know, this kind of 1.2 miles diameter, there is from one side, you know, what it pushed me a lot is like, hey, I want to make it fly only with solar energy, and, you know, the sphere in this case is the best thing, and here and there, but, but somehow, you know, I, I always thinking like, it would be so beautiful that when we think about a city, is an aggregate of very simple and single houses. Uh, and, you know, and that's the scale. Does it mean, you know, the construction of the city will be the wish of each single individual is somehow generate a big mountain. But, uh, but again, it's the participation of each single individual who somehow rely on the responsibility of each of us toward the construction of something. I mean, what, what that, I'm... That has been a city always. Yeah, yeah. Well, yes, no. That's what I would say completely, no. That would have been the city of, of the neglected, I mean, it's like, let's say, the, my role, like, say, like put it on the architect to a scale, is like a, how we could engage people and citizens and, and, and everybody in engaging the participation of the urban planning, how we can convince all of you that it's beautiful to build a city and how we can build it together. Now it's in the hands of developers, who sometimes make horrible thing, money, there is a kind of a whole horrible scene behind it. And, and, and very little people, even architects, do not have so much influence. And for me, it's about how we can spread or try to engage people into the construction of a city. In this case, a flying city, but we could do also like a, a normal city. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's more about to invent a platform. Let's say how beautiful it would be if we managed to build together as we did Linux or as or as this improving Wikipedia uh, knowledge, uh, we could somehow build a city. Uh, that somehow each, you know, it's like go back more to, let's say, Jonah Friedman, uh, architecture and mobile, and, and you know, there is a tra tradition also into the architecture scenario of trying to, to, in, to involve the people in, in, into the use or misuse of, of something. And, and, and I think that's really something which, which I would love to see more. Uh, uh, on, on a different scale. Let me ask you this. If MIT were to offer you a, the commission of a new building on campus with the full engagement of our uh, faculty and student cohorts, would you, would you accept the commission? Are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> That's not even a question. But I will try to convince you to make it fly. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, but I think so. There is there will be no beautiful. I mean, I'm always trying to think. It's a building, and you, I mean, if now we we, we kind of uh, start to breathe, 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 and then we go up, we go up, we go up. It's kind of closing up in the end because we exhalate hot air, you know, somehow. Or, or you know, it's like a, a building. You know, you come up in the morning and you say, oh, which temperature is it, which temperature is today? And you see the building is like so high or so low because it's like a thermometer in the city which goes up and down. Or when you get tired of MIT, you can just take off and go somewhere. <laughs> no, but the other thing also, what it drives me crazy in Germany is like, uh, is the, and now it's getting the winter and the bad weather. This means sometimes people travel so, you go to Palma de Mallorca or beautiful weather, but sometimes you forgot. It's like a, just a few kilometers above where the same spot you are is a super sunny day. It's just like up, not so far, right? And then people travel horizontally, but where the vertical component is... Uh, it's kind of missing somehow. I tell you, like, a very small story was uh, I was in, in St. Petersburg for three weeks, and there was no sun at all. No sun, no sun, no sun. Then I got in the plane, finally out, and then the, usually in Argentina, we still, when the plane is landing, we used to clap. You know, there is some kind of sensibility <laughs> for me. Still. <laughs> but what it happened, the plane, it crossed the level of the clouds, and people start to clap. They saw the sun. <laughs> And then I say, oh my God, that's the first participant. You know, with them, I will not have problem to convince them that I'm doing a cloud up there, you know, <laughs> above the level of the cloud. This you mean? Uh, I don't know. 
Tomas, you fly when you're working with the public. May I use this opportunity to open questions to your public out here? There are two microphones, one on this side and one on the other side, and help to open up this discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thomas. This is fantastic. Um, I'm not an artist. <clears throat> I'm not an architect. I did see your exhibit in Berlin. And getting back to the original question about who's your audience, to me, the audience were the people who were participating in that exhibit, climbing into the spheres, looking at it, experiencing uh, unmitigated delight. And I think that what's really important for me, at least, and I had no idea about your background as an architect, is your creation of opportunities for delight. For, the uh, for delight. Delight. No, delight as in <laughs> delight, joy, <laughs> whatever. Ah, delight. Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that too, delight, delight as well. Um, and the other thing, even about the spider, about the spider web, that was stunning to look at uh, and sort of seeing the dependencies and interdependencies among the various threads. So examining or, or experiencing your work and thinking of and from the point of view of an audience, from the point of view of a participant, you did mention social participation to a degree, but to me, that is like looms as number one and is what makes your work that I've seen and that I read about the project you did in Frankfurt at the Russ Market extraordinary. And, and I really hope that you know, you can continue to focus on that. The issues around whether it's architecture or whether it's whatever, to me are, this may be not the right thing to say right now, irrelevant. Mm. Mm. Ah. Your work takes my breath away, but I'm just curious as how long one can... Your, your work takes my breath away, I, I'm just like... T touched by your work, but um, I would like to know how long um, someone is able to stay in, in, in your, occupy your space. How long would, yeah. can you stay no, in, 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 in the web? Uh, you, in, we, the, in, in, in which how, space? I in your space where the people are, uh, I'm not sure. In that, that what Italy, one of the beginning. Yeah, anyone, how many hours, days are, can ah, Abner? Oh. Can um, no, I always yeah. thought, like, it, you know, the, this museum during the night uh, did not have really, like, a function. And I say, why we don't make a kind of a, a hostel or a hotel that people could go there? And it's like a huge mattress. We could sleep all together, you know? <laughs> but um, no, usually, I mean, they have a timing. Uh, it's like a, I think, so half an hour you can be up there. And then, you know, like, um, they, otherwise, you know, I don't know. I don't, I don't know what will happen, actually. Uh, but but, but th there is a timing that you get inside, you get a number, and then for ten, half an hour you can be there and then go down. And then, uh, but all we will say is like a, on the top or one of the levels, uh, but on the bottom you can stay as long as you want. This means also, you know, uh, my mother never went up there, you know, she always like, <laughs> up, down, yes. Yeah. But. Thank you. Um, in your conversation with Nada and um, Anto before, you, you keep like resisting their, your work from like architecture. Um, so I'm just curious about like, because in your work you present a really strong connection with architecture actually. Like they share the idea of like social space, their gravity, their public engagement. And uh, this idea has just come across like the art and architecture. And I'm just wondering, um, how do you think your previous architectural education um, contribute to, to your work? Or um, in another way to put it, like, um, how do you think your work will in turn contribute to other architectural approach? Um, no, I don't know so much, but uh, maybe you know much better than me uh, how, uh, how you know, it's like, a, maybe you can tell me. I mean, you, we, we have been together with, uh, in the conversation with, uh, no, in the, in the, when we were with Skylar together? No, you were not there. No? I <laughs> know, oh, I forgot now, I mixed it up. But, 
Um, what should I answer? I don't know. Um, No, I, well, next. <laughs> no, but what, I, you are an architect, or what? You study architecture? Yeah. Yeah, super. Uh, I, I, hope, I, I hope so we can influence each other all the time. No, yeah, let, okay. let, let, let's see how, like how we, we, we can build it together. Uh, no, I mean, what was is like a, uh, when we were at the, I, I was the other day at the media lab also trying to convince them to help me on get some sense, not to measure the temperature of people when they're up there. No, because the media lab also, there is this kind of strange intersection also of how they put all this sensor on the building up there and then and how you know, you can track conversation or, or temperature. And that was, for me, would be pretty useful to, because the problem is like when you have to rescue somewhere there, that it never happened yet, right? But, uh, but in case, and, and also it's like how much information you give to the person to be able to, to move into that space, no? Let's say on this big uh, um, air uh, uh, moving. This means usually what I always tend uh, to say is like you don't have to say nothing to them. Let's put it that I'm trying to answer your question on architecture, no? It's more about like a, which information uh, is necessary to give to somebody <coughs> and if is necessary to use or misuse this space. In that, in that way, in that uh, space that, that, was, created, that was there, uh, usually they are very severe with me. They, they tell, look, the public first, take out your shoes, take out the, everything from your pocket because you might make a hole and you fall down 20 meters. Uh, don't go to the border, don't get together so much, don't do this, don't do that. Then at the end it's like, oh my God, don't tell this to the people. You know, I hate this kind of, uh, uh, you know, it's a space that you might experience. And at the end it's contradictory also with the na same nature of how people might be able to experience it and to learn from kind of a feedback, a relationship between us, no? or, or between how it's used and this use. This means I thought, like, you know, with a, maybe with a media lab, uh, sensing, and then it's much more less responsible because when you enter the space, and I'm always talking about architecture, and they tell you all the things that you can do or you cannot do, somehow you are enter much more confident because you say, oh, they told me I can do this, they told me I can do that, you know, and then you move. If I, the strategy that I'm always time trying to, to avoid is like, don't tell nothing to the participant who are there. When they enter there, they are kind of, oh my God, what the hell is going on? You go, Whoa, you go down, you, say, oh, you know, it's like, a, somehow the, the learning process is much more, your responsibility toward the space or toward the planet, let's put it that way, it's much more engaging and, and it works much better. You know, it's much more attuned, you know. It's much more uh, sensible. So I had a question about, um, the talk is called Beyond Materiality, and um, it's really fascinating, but, so basically, so there's, there's space, which is the negative, then there's the solid object, which shapes the space. And so when, if, if it's beyond materiality, is it that materiality, is it wrapped back around that the space is the primary investigation? And it seems like that's, you're really interested in the space, but like Nadir was talking about, something has to shape and define that space. And so, for example, the plastic sheets define the different layers and how people move with the space closed behind you was actually the, the mylar sheets that would close behind you. So the materiality, is it just whatever is needed to create the, the environment? Or like, is it just that the, whatever uh, you can get your hands on, whatever is actually, um, does the job like the, I think there was a question about what th thickness of thread you'd use for the the spider web was it just whatever you was available or you said okay this is too elastic this is too stiff so this one works so it's just there was no kind of um overt thought about well this is the material it's just that well this is what works best to define the space and create you know the, the environment yes <laughs> <clears throat> No, about material, <clears throat> I'm, I'm here I enjoy also at MIT. I mean, we, 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 we visit with Leila, which was fantastic, many uh, experts on different materials, you know, 
for example, would be wonderful if, but these, these nano graphene tubes are not still available to buy, I would love to have them. To, to, I'm trying to build now a, a flying plaza. There is this, uh, or, again, this graphene, graphene no? these sheets, very, very light. Uh, if I would get this to make next solar balloon, it will be much more smaller. I need less volume, less material, but still it's not available. Uh, this mean is a, yeah, it's a negotiation al always, you know. I mean, the sheets that I'm using at PVC, um, it would be nice to make them with ETFE, which will long, last more, much more longer. Um, I, I don't know if, if it answered exactly the question, but... Uh, well, I guess it's just your, your main focus is the space. Whatever shapes the space yeah. is whatever it needs to be. Yes. Yes. Yeah. But let me put it again. For example, in Museo Solare, you no, know, uh, this uh, kind of huge uh, museum, which fly made of uh, reused plastic bags. Also, the material over there, you know, is like um, people bring it or people tape it at their home. And the space also is something which is pretty undefined because it's due to collaboration of the persons that the space keep growing and the collection it keep growing. And and somehow else there is this. Let's say put it in architecture. There is always this problem that. Uh, sometimes uh, um, architecture build a museum that is too big for the collection or too small for that collection, and you know you don't have enough space. Then you you show this uh, art, and you don't have to change. I mean, it, it's beautiful. This museum somehow it, it always show all the collection, which is the plastic base somehow, and it keep growing because every time you add more, it kind of get it bigger and uh, get it bigger, and. And I think so. And that's also like a space which just grow through the participation of people. Or, or get it small. You know, now at the moment there are three museums. One in Helsinki, one in Italy, and one in Germany. Sometimes what we do, before there were many more, and now we, we glue them all together and the space get bigger. As bigger it gets, as more lift is. There will be a moment maybe we can carry a person up there also. But, uh, but it also changed. And I think it's also nice to, uh, you, know, uh, you know, when you see it, you see every single piece, you know, somehow you, you, you get the idea of, of how was done somehow, maybe, of the materiality of, of it, no? Which is, it get really personal somehow. You know, Hugo Santa Maria in Colombia, in Medellin, and, and every uh, situation or, or culture or, or, or scenario, it completely changed also how it's appropriated. Somehow Hugo Santa Maria was in charge of many community in different favelas in, in Medellin, and then he said, oh, you know, we, we, we will ask, and he ran workshop for, for, for with, with, with children, and then they were kind of using like to make drawings on top, and then you know, everybody do some. Then when we were at Minneapolis in, in St. Louis, because we wanted to let it fly, and then we start to work with somebody, a retired person from NASA, and then the um, FAA, Federal Aeronautic Aviation, you know, to let fly such a big chunk of plastic, you have to have a way to bring it down. This means we build a sensor to kind of cut it, and then I don't know. You know, also space, you know, because you, you, do, you have to fly but not interfere with the aeroplane. That's another space, you know, the space you occupy. Yeah, uh, I'd like to draw attention to the fact that in almost every picture we've seen, there's a human being. And it might be like an obvious uh, fact, but I think it, it's important to stress it uh, in the conversation uh, because it, it addresses also the thing of the audience, the architecture, and the materiality. Because um, even, in, even in Venice with the spiders, um, there's in the picture that we saw, there's this guy standing next to it with a little plastic uh, shoe protectors. And the, the shoe protector is um, creating like a distance from the floor so that the floor doesn't, doesn't become a floor uh, by uh, getting some dirt on it, um, yeah. and so that we can still see the white, uh, which is the same white, so that the, ma the man who is looking at the thing and is pondering this uh, spider web is like floating um, in that um, uh, air, right? Um, so I, I seem to, to identify this um, importance of the human being, the, the, the balloon that is floating with the sun, um, there's somebody hanging. There's always somebody there uh, being floated by the material. And, and so the, the question of the materiality is also um, related to this presence of the human being, because the human being is very real, very material, very, very there, very physical. And uh, it is um, a whole collection of devices to um, bring this physical person 
into a, a, an immaterial uh, atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Is is that a conscious search, or is it something that I'm just seeing? Uh, no, no. I, I I I love to. I love people. Still. <laughs> 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 no, 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 yeah. But, but I'm, I'm disappointed, you know. I, I think so. Tomorrow is, uh, no, when is the homage to Enrico Fermi that Friedman had? Eh? Monday. Mo Monday, 3.30. He, he, or somebody have wrote a, a book based on one of the sentences that he always said, uh, where is everybody, right? Where is everybody? And then, um, and then I will tell you now a story which kind of rephrase maybe the same, which I think so is a, is a story by Stanislav Lem, written in a Carl Sagan book. I don't know if it's Voyager or, or some of the other one. And then there are people on, always about people, I'm telling you. There are people on the planet Earth trying to see if there is life or there are other people in another planet. And then the, fir the first, what they do, they are sort of astronomers, let's put it that way, they build a telescope of that size, no? And then they look and they say, oh, there is nobody up there. The next year, they build a telescope a little bit bigger. They look again, oh, there is nobody up there. Then the next year, they make it a little bit bigger like this. They look or nothing. And then the telescope keeps growing, growing, growing. Now, there is a moment that the telescope is so big that the other ones see first the telescope, and we through the telescope see the other one. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, and I love this idea of... of, of you know, and it's again, you know, where is everybody? You know, I, I wish we might be able to take into account more, you know, even beyond this, this, this planet, you know. And maybe, yeah, I don't know. Kind Thank of, you. Um, um, I have a two-part question about the uh, spider web in Venice. The first is a very MIT kind of tech question, and I'll add, ask the other one later. The structure, once you have the map of what the spider did and you have your thing you wish to create, you have so many degrees of freedom, it's very, very difficult to make it. So as you were putting it together, what was more important to you? What was your priority? The topology, in other words, this node is connected to this node is connected to that node, or where the node ended up in space? No question. Uh, where the, uh, no, I was pretty much obsessed to try to build it as perfect as possible. You know, that, that's, I don't know if I answered the first question. Uh, and then the other, I think so. Um, um, I always uh, think, you know, it's like it was an exercise. Just, I want that this node end up here and go here, and then from here it go here. So you kept going until everything was right? Yeah, I want to become yeah. a kind of Spider Man. <laughs> So the second part of the question is more philosophical. For you, what was the most important part of the art? Developing the method to make the spider web or the finished web? Uh, I, I, the art for me was really like a, to build this web between relationship of people. Again, maybe the people were not so visible, but the kind of a beautiful spirit of collaboration that we weave between us. That was really the work, which is invisible again. Yes. But I think so that's, that really drives me completely. I mean, it was really beautiful, which is not even in the work, but somehow showed that this was possible thanks to something which is unaccountable, new friendship or whatever it is. But I think so that really, that's really the work, I think so. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a question, which is, <laughs> we, you've talked a lot about um, sort of the importance of the sort of social interaction and the sort of people occupying the space, but you've also mentioned um, briefly how sort of the institutions where you're placing these works have asked you to make compromises in how people are using them. When and how do you decide what compromises you're willing to make? Ah, it's always a, a very like you sense it yourself. No, say hey, until you know something. They ask you, no, 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 no. And then one moment you explode. You say, okay, bust. I don't want to do it. You know, <laughs> but, but otherwise you 
yeah, kind of you, you, you always accept some things, some not. But mostly the, the thing is like what I try to do is, is never being myself and then there is the institution. And it's, so we work together right from the beginning, you know, because mostly our project, which are like, it costs like a 30 times more budget that they offer me. I mean, if they don't want to do it from their side, it's almost impossible right from the beginning to do it. You know, because it's really like a, this, I mean, they're very, very engaged from the beginning because usually it's a little bit more ambitious and there are these kind of architectural scale in some of them, which kind of, uh, you know, also, you know, and, and sometimes institutions also are not so used to work at that scale, which also kind of get a lot of troubles also for, you know, curators and museum and this institution because it's like, oh my God. Uh, and me also somehow because I never really practice architecture so straightforward. Uh, this mean um, it, 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 it comes together somehow always. Some, something. Like so are that. you saying your art is in upping the budget thirtyfold? <laughs> <laughs> Don't say this. You said you got me commission. Yeah. <laughs> well, we have time for one more question, and then we need to wrap it up. Hello. Okay. I discovered you on Sunday, and I, I'm not affiliated with this school or architecture at all. Um, so I see that your work um, exists in outside space and inside space. Do you enjoy, or are you um, more inspired by um, a space that's like really vast with so much potential, or do you enjoy the limiting spaces that are smaller or in like interior? Yeah. No, both. I think so. And always, you know, the space inside your brain is like a kind of, you know, there is always this analogy also, the spider web, many, you know, how, I think so we are visiting somebody who is specializing in connectomes uh, on Monday, and, and then it's kind of the inner, uh, you know, connectivity of, of cells, and, and this is mean, um, I think so, you know, you know, there is, you know, it's, Kind of this simultaneously, you know, uh, simultaneity between uh, the appreciation of, of, of these multiple scales, which, uh, which kind of make me enthusiastic. Uh, and then, then, you know, when it, it does, doesn't work in one scale, I say, well, you know, it might work in some other scale inside my brain or inside the brain of somebody else or, or something like this. Thomas, you've been very generous with your time and your thinking. You're still here, so people have more access to him. I just want to thank you again for this wonderful... Thank you, Oliver. <laughs>